Explorer. I'm your producer, Todd Bartu, and this is the Offshore Explorer. Offshore Explorer looks at the world from a sailor's point of view, port by port. Together, we share stories that detail the important intersections between sailing culture and life, past, present, and future. Let me introduce our host, a lifelong sailor who has traveled the world, from mega yachts to tugboats to ice boats, and a published author who has written for both stage and screen, Captain Scott Todson. Yeah, hey Todd, uh, having a little bit of uh, a chill here. Um, the high today is only going to be about 50 degrees, and um, for Southern California, that's uh, pretty chilly. Yeah, it is, and um, I'm doing great. I'm excited about today's episode, um, but before we get into that, I hold in my hand another five-star review. And this <laughs> week, our five-star review comes from Bobby, who comments, 10-star review. Offshore Explorer brings you into the world of sailing and cruising through the adventures of Scott Dodson. Offshore Explorer is so easy to listen to that you feel as if you were talking to a lifelong friend over a sundowner. <laughs> the entertainment value is abundant to say the least, but what I enjoy the most is the inspiration to dream big and live your life on your own terms. I assure you of one thing. When an episode ends, the first feeling you have is more. Thank you, Bobby, for those kind words. And we appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Bobby. Big time shout out. I appreciate it very, very much. And uh, the best to you guys. I appreciate it. And if you want us to read out your five-star review on the show, be sure to go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and drop us a five-star review. Now, with that out of the way, what do we have in store for today's episode? Uh, today, I'm talking about boat kids. Uh, boat kids, um, in my sailing mind and world, boat kids are a special breed. Um, I cover a couple of different aspects of it, uh, chartering with boat kids, um, boat kids who live aboard uh, with their parents, um, kids that are boat kids but kind of hang around the docks. And um, then there's the other kids that are out there trying to set records and sail at young ages and bunches of other things and become real uh, um, stars in the sailing world. Um, but for me, I, I was a boat kid. I mean, I didn't live aboard, but I hung around docks. I had my own little boat. And uh, wherever there was water I could get the boat into, uh, I was out there sailing. So that was, this is something very special to me. And just as an aside, these kids that do this are just brilliant, responsible, can stand watches. I mean, I just, I just dig it. Great. Take it away, Scott. I chartered for roughly 18 years, and that's, you know, running a boat, uh, keeping it Bristol, um, being charming, uh, inviting guests to your boat, sailing them around, showing them some new stuff. Um, and basically trying to create an environment where it's the best experience that they'll ever have on a vacation. I think most people who end up chartering, um, they either hit it off with the crew um, or they sort of, they make this whole thing like they're distant. And chartering is different on different levels. Um, I was basically a smaller boat. Uh, a CT-54. Um, I could handle eight guests and two crew. I often had just two crew. Um, but I would do, you know, families, um, sometimes family uh, you know, four, sometimes family five, even six, um, and of all different ages. And I wanted to talk about boat kids and their relationships and boat kids and their relationship to the boat and to the sea. I want to start out by first saying that I think boat kids, and I mean this in a very general way, 
kids that get connected to sailing and boating in general, hanging out on boats, are uh, they just become special people. They just have this whole special kind of attitude of responsibility, of individuality. Uh, they make good citizens. Um, their mental acuity and thought processes are pretty sharp, and they grow even sharper the longer they do stuff. And I've seen it in a lot of different ways, boat kids in different ways. And, you know, first of all is like, for those parents or people out there who are thinking about going and, and chartering and taking your kids out on a charter and you're a bit uh, cautious, shall we say, um, you know, you're worried about the, uh, the little ones, the safety. And, you know, some, some you have to be a little bit worried about. But, uh, you know, once you get over... I mean, I've had babies, literally babies on the boat, and the babies have been just brilliant. The whole rocking motion and the ocean and stuff like that, the babies, they don't know any different. They think it's wonderful, and they sleep, they eat, they, they're very joyful, and they, babies do really well on boats. They do really well on boats. Or they do better on boats than they do even on land. And then when you get into the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours and the fives, they all, they're walking and climbing and testing things out and this and another thing. And they, and you know, they want to climb stairs. They want to get in the bunk bed. Um, I had a family of, I believe the little girl was like two years old and she followed her little brother who was five and he was just into everything and he climbed this he climbed that he was he was he was a real handful and she was right behind him and you know her, her mother her mother wanted to put a helmet on him and you know i i guess in this culture and the way we bring kids up today you know putting a helmet i mean as a kid when i grew up the only helmet i ever wore was a football helmet, uh, the rest of it, or a baseball helmet for Little League. That was it. Um, the rest of the time, you rode your bikes without helmets, and I'm sure there's somebody that's out there statistically going, oh, yeah, well, we're much more safe, and there's less head injuries and stuff. And, I, you know, I get all that. You know, on boats with little ones like that, I've never had a problem with any kid hitting their head. The people I have problems with are usually the middle-aged um, women and and sometimes the grandmothers. Um, I've saved more grandmothers over the side than I hate to uh, hate to say. I mean, you know, I've heard the call, you know, at night where grandma's overboard and I go racing up and dive into the water and find grandma swimming towards the bottom rather than swimming towards the top because she lost her glasses and rescue her get her back in the boat and you know she was just walking lost her balance and blew off the boat and i get that 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 can happen and it's you know something you always want to be aware of is why we have safety lines and tell people to put one hand for the boat and is that another thing kids kids though are just like what you have to understand parents is that kids get on a boat and they are in a world of their own proportionality. The ceiling is lower. The beds are a little bit smaller. The bunk beds especially are totally accessible. I mean, you take a 10-year-old and you put him on a boat, there's nowhere he isn't going to go. He's going to just take over the whole boat. He's going to get so confident. And it's so many little things happened. And... Kids just love being on the boat. They love the whole sail thing. They love jumping off the boat into the water. They love, they love the actual sailing of the boat. Um, and I have gotten them to do a number of other tasks like cleaning up their cabin, um, washing off the boat, you know, helping me uh, clean fish, 
um, you know, playing with the lobsters. You know, th there's a lot of things kids can do. The problem is, is generally it's parents. Parents who hover. Now, I must admit, I was never a parent who hovered. Um, I would be probably the parent that would be accused of not paying enough attention to their kids. And, um, you know, let them roam. Let them discover. I mean, when I first started sailing as a kid, I mean, I can't remember how old. I mean, I know that I was sailing according to my to my parents when I was one and two years old. I know that I was in a little uh, sail dinghy when I was about six, and I was sailing that around, and by myself, you know, and um, I just, I remember sailing with my grandfather on a little bit, which I thought was a huge boat, which turns out wasn't very big at all, and then, of course, you know, in high school, I bought my own sailboat, which I've talked about in um, previous previous shows um, called Steppenwolf, which is a, a sloop, Herschoff design sloop. And so I, I grew up as a boat kid in the sense that I was a boat kid during the summer. I was a boat kid. Um, that's all I did all summer. You know, I, I got involved with Hobie cats. I mean, Hobie cats to me were like the drag racers of of the boating world at the time um and as todd has often said that i raised international 14s a totally different animal um but you know just go fast go fast compete and this that another thing and the, the go fast compete sailor um is not the boat kid i'm talking about i i love seeing the little kids out on the sailboats, especially uh, Marina del Rey. And of course, they, they also have uh, boats over in Cabrilla Marina down in uh, Long Beach and Newport, or, or Long Beach, Newport, um, LA Harbor. You know, they have really great sailing clubs for young children. And I think that's fantastic because they get a handle of it. They're independent. They go sailing around. They get it. They adapt to it. They're a lot, they have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, it's just the, the people that fuck it up, quite honestly, are the parents. Because they're so competitive. They want their kids to be competitive. And they want to race. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's for the kids to sail, not for the parents to race. That's kind of thing. So when I get these kids back on the boat... And the parents are nervous. The kids don't quite know what to do because it's like, you know, candy store time for them. So my first thing is is to, to get the, the, the parents boozed up. Get them a drink. Let them relax. Explain to them that I don't like kids. And quite honestly, I was never a fan of kids. I was a fan of me as a kid, and, uh, but I just generally don't like kids. And because I don't like kids, um, and I have a tendency to treat kids as um, little adults, stunted growth adults, or short adults, as a friend of mine used to say, you know, I, I, I will happily teach them stuff, but if they don't want to learn, I don't care. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll prank them all day. Um, and, you know, as a side, there's, there's a lot of truth in the Captain Ron movie um, about the boy, you know, gravitating to Captain Ron as his new mentor and his father, Martin Short, you know, feeling he has to make something up. He has to be better than, than who he is or be different than who he is. And, you know, it's, the movie has a lot of really interesting kind of growth things as well as being hilarious. Um, but there's, there's uh, some truth in that in that film and i've faced it numerous times over the 20 some odd years that i chartered um i become because i'm the captain um i become the their mentor i become that version of captain ron in their minds and i know there's kids with plenty of memories about that that sale um that week charter 
um, that are all grown up now. And somewhere in their deep memory, or over the dinner table, they'll bring up Scott and Captain Scott, and it's sort of the same thing as uh, Captain Ron, and they have very fond memories of it. And uh, I'm okay with that. I'm okay being that character in their lives. Because as a charter boat captain, you're sort of the, you know, your character. You know, you, and it's, it's very well, I very well choreograph everything. It's as I make a, a great effort, uh, making sure everything is um, at right time. Timing is done. You know, I used to do this thing where I always, I, there's a hole where a bunch of lobsters live. And I would dive down, t- take the boat in, drop the anchor, and there's a beautiful little anchorage. People would get all like, wow, this is so cool, you know, because there would be cliffs right around it. And, you know, it would just be the perfect place. And I would just say, I'll be back with lunch. And I'd dive off the boat and I'd go down and I'd grab a lobster, or two lobsters out of the hole and throw them up on the deck. And people would just go, oh, my God. And then I'd put them in the grill and we'd listen to them scratch for a few seconds and then would have fresh lobster for lunch. So that was like one of my little cool tricks they used to do. I used to always time my presence around their table, um, maybe one night or two nights out of seven, where I would join them well after dessert and um, explain what the next day is going to be like, tell them stories, um, enjoy the wife would go to bed the husband and I would sit up and have a few drinks and then eventually he'd be off to bed and you know it was like that and the kids you know they would be downstairs they'd be watching TV you know because I had this big library of videotapes back in the day of videotapes and they would just you know their whole night they'd all snuggle up and if we went on some long sales which we we did with a few families um, where it was kind of like an overnight, almost at nighttime sale. The kids were great. They would get a big blanket and they would tuck themselves away in the cockpit. Okay. And I'd tell them to look out for ships over here. You tell me if there's a light over there. And they would sit there for hours and hours. And the parents would always go, he doesn't have that kind of concent- uh, concentration. He's like ADD or ADH or whatever it is, whatever they call these kids that don't have concentration. I was one of those. But anyway, you know, I was late. I never got a label like that. I just was, you know, like pay attention, slap in the back of the head. And these kids would sit there for hours just looking out. Oh, I see a light way over there. What's that light? And then I'd explain to him, oh, that's a lighthouse. I said, count the light flashes. How long do they last? 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And what is their frequency for every minute? And they would sit there and they'd try to figure it out. And I'd give them a light book and I'd say, tell me which light that is. And they'd find it. They'd figure it out. They'd find it. Keep them occupied for hours, for hours. And, and they were digging it. They were digging it. So the parents, I always have to warn is first of all, parents... If your kid's a fussy eater on land, he won't be a fussy eater on a boat. He'll eat anything we put in front of him. If he doesn't eat, we'll throw him in the ocean. They get that kind of penalty. And they have no problem with it. And they're good. I always tell them I'm going to feed them to the sharks if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't sort of, you know, get better or stop acting out or whatever the case they do. Um, And they kind of do, they kind of get the whole thing. I remember once a kid said to me after I threatened him with feeding him to the sharks, he says, you mean we'll see a shark? And I said, yeah, you got to keep your eyes out. I said, because they swim under the boat. They swim beside the boat. I said, they may, they may not be there, but you got to keep them. That kid, I think we did like a five hour sail that day. And that kid never took his eyes off the water looking for that shark. They're so easily manipulated. So much fun. The parents, um, have to understand that their kids are going to attach um, to the crew because we're not their parents. We're kind of their friends. 
Um, we don't care about how they're raised. Um, we don't care that they, you know, pick their nose or eat with their fingers or whatever the case may be. We don't give a hoot about that kind of stuff. And we like them, and we like them because we're being paid, basically, to like them. Now, I'm being a little bit harsh on the kids. Yeah, some of the kids, I, there wasn't a single kid that was on the boat that I, I really didn't, you know, connect with and have a good time. But for the parents, they kind of get freaked out. Like, oh, my kids just love the crew. I had a couple of kids. They would they would go with my mate. And I think the husbands wanted to follow my mate around as well, who was, at the time, a um, couple of really beautiful, very strikingly beautiful um, French women that uh, the fathers couldn't get their eyes on. And the wives wanted to kill the fathers, and the kids just adored them because they were just, they spoke such funny language and blah, 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 and all the rest of this. A lot of fun. But there's always these dynamics. But the kids always make, they always make make it through. They, you know, they like exploring new allegiances. That's that's something they like to do. They like to find out about it. They're not going to give up their parents. Nobody is. But the parents are so insecure sometimes that they figure that they're going to trade them in because they're always mean. The kids are not afraid after a very, very short time. they Where they wouldn't go into the pool and go swimming in the deep end, um, they're very willing to, to, to jump off the spreaders, you know, 20 feet high into 35 feet of water and go splashing and climb up the ladder and, and just, you know, dive off the boat to go off the bowsprit, you know, do flips off the bowsprit. That was one of the favorite things the kids used to do. Um, they'd line up, you know, walk their way out to the bowsprit and just, you know, do, a, you know, get on the other side because I was about a, a foot extension in the bowsprit in front of the head stay. And they would just, um, they'd stand up there and then just flip off the boat. And, and they loved it because they could, they could grab the uh, spider and, and they could do pull-ups and they could hang on it and they were in the water and uh, phew, never worried about kids. Never worried about that. And then, of course, there was snorkeling for the boat kids, you know, on charter. And once, you know, I, I, I had a 10-year-old that I fitted with a mask. We had a problem with the mask. His face was a little weirdly shaped for the masks that I had. And, and we, we finally got it to fit. We got a mask to fit on his face, right? And he finally got enough suction so the water wouldn't get in. And he refused to take it off. He would be, he'd sit in the cockpit after swimming, snorkeling, and, and not take his mask off because he didn't want to break the seal. He says, it's so good right now. I says, I'm just catching my breath. But the kids love the snorkel. And once they discover that world and they get they go crazy and and you know putting fins on a kid a lot of parents want to put life jackets on them and that whatever if the kids moderately you know just a little bit of a good swimmer can go five ten feet you could teach them how to snorkel and float with the fins on with big fins kids fins of course but big and they, they'll just float along the surface with their snorkel and they will, you, the parents will be surprised at how easy these kids can swim over very long distances. And what happens is, is rather than the whole idea, the craziness of swimming, you know, the parents are, oh, you got to swim, you got to stroke, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to breathe. Da, da, da. And the parents, you know, project all this sort of anxiety as they're trying to teach. They get into snorkeling and their mind goes away from the swimming part. It goes away from the breathing part, and all they see are the fish and the coral on the bottom of the sea, and they're fascinated by it. And the next thing you know, they'll pop up and go, oh my God, where am I? And they've been swimming straight for 20 minutes with their head under the water. I have seen this happen so many times, and my advice to parents when you're taking your kids out, you know, let them be. They'll be okay. Don't over-safety them. Let them be. 
they'll figure it out. Kids are much more resilient. I mean, you think about back on the, you know, the age of sail, the English sailing ships and French sailing ships. You know, they had they had squeakers, they called them, right? Who were eight, nine, ten years old, who who were ships boys. And they were on these big ships and they were working every day. Okay? They were fighting battles, fixing sails, doing doing what little squeakers did. Then they would become midshipmen. And midshipmen are, are nothing were nothing more than 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 boys, you know. And then they would become a lieutenant after taking their test, which was about after 15, 16 years old. And they would become a lieutenant. Yeah, they, I mean, kids, kids, pretty resilient. They can take on responsibility. They can understand what it means. So I always try to sort of separate the parents from the kids so that the parents can actually enjoy themselves so they can actually just kick back and say yeah i don't have to worry about the kids right now even though i do i mean i actually had kids scraping varnish just to give them something to do i've had them coil lines flake sails tie knots i taught them how to drive a boat i used to teach them how to drive a dinghy take them water skiing and then i had this wonderful thing where i, I found this boat it's a little tiny catamaran it's called spider and it's a pain in the ass to put together but once you got it together it's really great fun my boat was just a little too small in terms of size for it so i used to throw all the parts it, it came in a giant sail bag um the pontoon and everything was really small and i'm, I'm talking about is no longer than say a car seat you know the old-fashioned car bench seat no longer than that so I would take it to the beach, and I'd bring the kids with me, and we'd put together the spider, and it was a catamaran, and this thing could fly in the lightest of winds. And we used to, we used to, I used to let the kids go out, and, you know, they'd crash it. And I said, yeah, whatever, who cares? You know, and everybody would get crazy. We had them, uh, we would have them chopping vegetables. We would tell the kids, all right, we got to eat. Who's going to start chopping vegetables? And the kids, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. Because they love being part of the system. They love being like kind of grown up and being a part of the system. And that's what they do. They kind of make their, they make their bed. You know, I told them, I said, if you don't make your bed, you don't eat. I don't care. I'm not responsible for you. And they just, they would become a very willing um, and enthusiastic work workforce, which was really pretty freaking funny. And, um, they would listen to it. They would listen to us and they would do super do super good. And, you know, they were all wonderful and they had a wonderful time and they, um, they all had tears in their eyes when they left us, um, because it was a great kind of hands on. They, they learned a lot. And I think the parents learned probably even more. So boat kids in terms of charter parents, let them have fun. You have your fun. It'll all work out. And if you lose them, well, you know, it's one less tax deduction. There's another kid, and this is sort of kind of the category that I would fall into is is um, sort of the uh, dock kids. They're boat kids, um, but they go out on boats. They live on boats. They sail around a little bit, but for the most part, they're kind of tethered to a particular dock. And I'm, I'm thinking of uh, my little buddy Toby um, of Coral Bay. Now, Toby's a grown, grown-ass man now, um, but when I first met Toby, he was... Um, eight years old, I think, seven or eight years old. And he was doing flips off of a bowsprit to a boat that was half sunk. And he had a snorkel mask on and he, he was uh, uh, fishing. Um, uh, he was, he was, he did everything. And his mom and dad, they owned a little marine store 
um, and they, they would get supplies and sell supplies. And um, she would also um, do some sewing and uh, she made some canopies for me and some Dodgers and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And, and, and Toby was the one that, that had to bring the supplies out to my boat because I had a mooring in Coral Bay and, and was fairly far out. And so he would, he had a little sailing dinghy and he would like put cans of varnish that I ordered or something like that. And I would order them, you know, using the radio and, um, then he would row out and I'd hand him the money and then he row back or sail out depending on which way the wind is going. And, uh, he would come on board. It was kind of a little bit long, uh, pull and, um, but he would climb, you know, straight up on the boat. Hey, what are you doing? What's going on? This, that, and everything. He's very, very fascinated by everything. Very interested. I mean, he. I found him once in my aft cabin looking through all the closets. I said, what are you doing, Toby? He says, it's just, you have so much closet space. I can't believe it. And he was just like going on and on and on because they, they had a, I think their boat was like a 32, 30, yeah, 32 something. And uh, 30, 30, um, 32 West Sail, I think. So it was real small. Not much closet space. And my boat, of course, was luxurious for him in terms of size. And and he would come out, and, and if I needed a hand, like if I needed an extra hand to help me do a couple of odds and ends kinds of thing. He literally went, um, he climbed up my mast without the assist of anything and help me get a spreader down. He just climbed straight up like one would climb a, a um, palm tree. And he had climbed palm trees. He, he was all over. He was like a little monkey. Toby is one of those kids that he really knows boats. He's into everything. He's, he used to help his dad fiberglass uh, boats. He, he could paint. Uh, he, could, he could varnish, not well, but he could varnish. And he was he was just a just a super little sailor. Um, I would put him up. I would have put Toby up against anybody in terms of sailing. Um, he had the best education that a dock kid could possibly get, because in Coral Bay, all these young guys and old guys and old salts um, who had these classic boats and they used to sail all the time and. And in order to sustain themselves, they would, you know, they'd run down to Columbia, and pick up some drugs, sail back. Then they, they'd end up getting sell, sold and all the rest. And, you know, Toby would go with them every once in a while. And, um, you know, because he was, there was nothing wrong with, he would never be arrested. He was too young, but boy, could he sail. He really could sail. I had him out on my boat a couple of times and he could sail. And he was always very gracious and he was very grateful and a a key thing about toby was his politeness and i i kind of realized for kids that hang around boats a lot um, they generally are very polite and they're very engaging and they're very um uh forgiving to a certain degree i mean they're very nice they 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 would they're always going to be helpful to a certain extent because they're always, they love getting on a boat. They're always looking, they're going to be nice to get on a boat. They always want to be on a boat, but they get their boat, they get their sail in. They, they're great fun to have around the boat. They know a lot of stuff. Um, they grow up pretty fast. They have an attitude that think they have an attitude that's a little bit different and they think a little bit different. Um, for them, the goal is always to get on the water and to sail. Um, I remember taking Toby out one time and, and, um, he was, uh, I put, I let him, uh, take the helm and he was, he said, this is the biggest boat I've ever sailed straight out. His first words out of his mouth, biggest boat I've ever sailed. He talked about sailing my boat with all his buddies down in the restaurant at Coral Bay, um, for weeks. It was just like his mom told me. He says, you, you created a monster. He wants a bigger boat. And she said, I can't afford a bigger boat. And I said, no, I'm sorry about that. And we all laughed. But the, Toby was, that, was that, kind of, that kind of kid, you know, on the beach, 
dirty feet, dirty hands, um, wandering around, doing chores for his mom and dad, helping out wherever he could. But boy, he just loved to sail. Couldn't wait to get on a boat. Would do anything, would, would swim out to a boat to get on it to go swimming or to go sailing. He would swim out to go sailing. But there's another kind of boat kid, which I wanted to get across to a few people. There were two more kinds of boat kids. The first is um, kids that are traveling around the world and living on a boat with their parents. Um, These are kind of real boat kids. Um, They're with their parents. They're making the voyage. They're essentially homeschooled. Um, They do watches. Um, They're they're not uh, fussed upon. Um, They do their work. Um, They have tasks and and chores to do on the boat. Um, When sailing, they they take their watches. They know how to handle the boat. They know how to change sails. And oftentimes, these kids are kind of from... 10, 12, 14, 15, that age. Um, And they get a lot of experience. And one of the great things about these kids is this. Their view of the world is amazing. Because kids, you know how kids are. You know, you, you drop a kid, it'll be shy for about four minutes. And then next thing you know, they're running around with a whole group of local kids. And that's exactly what happened to boat boat. What, that's exactly what happens to boat kids. Um, and I, there used to be a bunch of families that sailed around the Caribbean, and they would do their homework. And they had one of the women, one of the boats. Um, I can't remember her name. Um, anyway, she they used to have class by a single sideband radio. Right there. So the kids would all be on the radio. They'd be talking to each other. If they were close enough, they'd be on the VHF. You know, if they're in the same anchorage, they were in the VHF. So they would be going back and forth. This is obviously well before internet times. So every year during hurricane season, all these families, these liverboard families, would make a little rendezvous down in Tr- Trinidad. You know, they would work on their boats. Um, they'd anchor out. You know, things are pretty cheap in Trinidad for the most part. It's right across the Bay of Paria is right across from Venezuela, which is a little bit dicey these days. But, um, you know, Trinidad is a really cool place, and it's a kind of a cool place for kids. Um, you know, you the food is inexpensive. Fuel is very inexpensive. And, you know, they have good labor, good, good boat yards. And so what happens is all these kids that would go to school together via single sideband radio and or VHF would all rendezvous during hurricane season and just hang out in the boat yard. And in Chigamaramas, they have this, they have this beautiful grassy knoll and the kids all gather there. They'd play music, they'd have fires, they'd hang out together. And it's just not white boat kids around, but kids from every nation. There's a lot of different kinds of families that travel on boats. They're just not American. Um, You'll find more French and Italian than you will anybody else. You'll find German, okay, Dutch. Um, a lot of Spanish, you'll find, now you're finding a lot of, uh, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, um, Israeli, Turkish, sailing around the world as a group and a family on a boat. And so you have all of this thing. And in Trinidad, you have this integration going on and all the local kids are down with these kids and everybody's having a good time and they're, You know, they're talking about, oh yeah, we're going to rent a bus. And we're going to go out to the asphalt lake. There's a big lake that is just full of asphalt. It's part of a volcanic situation in Trinidad that you can go look at. And it stinks to high heaven of sulfur. But it's just like a giant um, 
parking lot that happens to bubble. But the kids get this sort of, you know, hands-on education. You know, they can tell you about Nelson. They can tell you about, and I've, I've had this experience with, with sitting with them, sitting me sitting underneath my boat with a beer in my hand and a bunch of the kids standing around and talking. And they say, have you ever been here? Have you ever been there? Have you ever? And, you know, of course, yeah, I've been there. And they're saying, did you know? They love to do this, did you know? Because they're, they're just so full of facts and, and things of interest, you know. And it's like, you know, Nelson's wife, okay, was born um, in Nevis. And that was a plantation, okay. Uh, she was a daughter of a plantation owner, okay. Now, the next island down is Martinique, okay. Our next one, two islands down, is Martinique, and that's where Napoleon Bonaparte's wife, Josephine, was born. Same kind of woman, the daughter of a plantation owner. So think about these two main characters in the history of the French and the English and, and wars and the Hundred Years' War and all the rest of the stuff. And, and their wives basically came from precisely the same island plantation culture. And the kids would tell me this, and they say, it's so fascinating, and did you know there's a flower that's got little baby Jesus in it? You could actually see it. It's in Nevis. It's the only, and they, <laughs> they would go on and on and on. And this is just, I have said this many, many times, that if, if I was hiring people um, for business, let's say a big major business, and th there was somebody with moderate skills, interesting, you know, definitely hireable, or a boat kid would walk in and say, yeah, I spent, you know, 15 years of my, my life on a boat sailing around the world. I'd hire the boat kid. Because here's what I know about a boat kid. They're super responsible. They take what they do very, very seriously. They have a very inquisitive mind, okay? They are brave, they're willing to withstand discomfort. They're able to um, connect with people through a variety of different cultures. They don't carry sort of this um, inborn prejudice against people of, of color or not color or of, of nationality or whatever the case may be. They're open to their friends and they're open to people all around the world. And I know that they can be taught very quickly and they can learn very, very quickly because they've, they've had to learn. I, I knew two, two bow kids in, um, specifically that would come over to my boat at the time I had a French maid to speak French with my mate because they had just learned French because they had spent a month in Guadeloupe which is French, and they wanted to practice, keep practicing their French. So they, they, would, they would sit there and, and, and speak French with Florence, and Florence wouldn't get any work done, and she was like the last person to be a school teacher, but um, she spoke French, and she was French, and so they just went on and on and on and on, and it was just this beautiful, you know, reciprocal, beneficial experience for all of them. So that's the kind of boat kid, when I say boat kids, I kind of refer to, but there's different kinds of boat kids. And then there is the, my dad, my family put me together and I had this dream of sailing around the world. And I'm thinking of uh, Laura Decker, the 14 year old who in 2010 sailed her boat Guppy and became the youngest person to go around the world alone. Um, there's a documentary on this. Um, it's, you know, it's it's really cool um, documentary, and she did a she did a wonderful job. And I remember her getting a lot of grief, um, her parents getting a lot of grief. And, you know, I've always thought if if the parents think their kids ready to do that kind of thing, and I mean their kids that are definitely not ready to do that kind of thing go sail around the world by themselves. But if they're parents that they, they can judge that their kid's going to be okay 
it's not the worst thing in the world that they could go out there. I'm sure if, if my kids went out there and started to sail around the world, um, I'd get a little bit nervous about it, but I'd still have enough confidence if I knew for sure in my heart of hearts that this kid was a boat kid. And Laura Decker was Dutch, um, and I think she she grew up on a boat. She was This was old hat to her sailing long distances already. So I didn't see that as being... It was just a kind of quest that she wanted to do, but I think you know how that goes, parents. You know, the parents sort of want something to happen like that, but it's hard to say. But that brings me back to... Um, someone I know, um, Abby Sunderland. And then she failed to circumnavigate the world as a 16 year old. Um, and they recently, they found her boat, uh, wild eyes floating off the Australian coast nearly like nine years, 10 years after she was rescued in the Indian ocean. And I know this because she left for Marina del Rey. Um, I know I donated money to the quest. Um, I know her father, Lawrence. Um, I know Zach. Um, and I'm sure if Zach is listening, um, he probably, um, he was young at the time. He, he also went, I remember being down on the boat and, and, and watching them go off. Both of them, uh, gave them a big hand, donated some money uh, talked to Lawrence actually several times. In fact, I saw Lawrence. He was down in uh, a couple of years ago. I, I ran into him. He has a um, ship business, repair business, um, and he does deliveries, etc. Which I think Zach is doing mostly of. But uh, you know, Lawrence and I we'd swap stories and and talk for a long time on the dock, and you know, it was pretty pretty casual, pretty cool. And uh, you know. Abby is now living in Alabama and she's got three or four kids and her life is going off in a particular direction that she's very much navigating on her own with her husband. And, um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a good thing. And I, I always think about this, especially with Abby that, I think she really wanted to do it, and I think she had enough experience as a as a young girl to to pull it off. Um, and I I think the same for Zach. I think there's a lot of competition in the family, and I think that um, their father Lawrence kind of kind of got in his own way. Um, I remember. There was uh, people trying to hook us up for a long time to write uh, write a movie about her, and of course they came to me as a screenwriter to um, see if I would do something. And you know, he finally decided I'll do it myself. I can do everything myself. And you know, you know, God bless him. But in any case, um, I, that whole episode is is done and passed, and people have gone off. But you know, I I I argued for the right for these young people to go sailing by themselves in the solo sail um, and to try to set some of these records. Um, it's a hard business. Sailing around the world is a young person's business, quite frankly. Um, it's fun if you're just going cruising. Like, you know, I know a lot of people of age who love to go cruising. Um, I know them. But a lot of these newbies that go out there, um, the physicality of it eventually turns them off to doing or just sitting in an anchorage somewhere and never really moving. But boat kids, on the other hand, boat kids are always moving. They're always looking for the next island. They're always looking for the next port. And they're always looking for the next adventure. So in a kind of summation, there is... You know, a boat kid like myself who grew up and summer sailed and different boats and eventually made sailing a whole uh, career kind of thing. Then there's the kids that just get a taste of it on a charter boat. And if they're lucky enough to have a captain that and a, and a mate that is willing to 
work with them and have fun with them and to teach them. And they're, they get that these people don't have to do shit for them. Um, but, you know, they can learn a lot and it changes them. It changes them in a little bit of ways to make responsibility important and, and how they can sort of have control of their own um, destiny. And this is kind of an important thing for children. And then there's the Toby Doc kids that um, are all over the boat and want to go here, want to go there, and um, know all the all the ins and outs of sailing and just can't wait to get on a boat. And um, you know, even if a kid was if a kid was like eight, nine, ten years old and he wanted to go sailing with me and, and he loved sailing and he'd been sailing before, I'd take him. You know. Take them. Let them. Let them. Let them drive your boat. Probably do it better than you. And then the real boat kids that are living on their boat, going to school by SSB or VHF, traveling the world, meeting new people. I don't know how you can get a better education. I don't know. You know, because education is all about teaching people, teaching young people how to think. And in this case, boat kids. They got it. They know how to think. They're past learning how to think. They're 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 out there just acquiring information and experience that's just going to make them a much better person than the next guy. And it's going to make them very individualistic in that regard because they'll be very, very centered and their feet on the ground. And then there's the other kids that the Lori Deckers and the Abby Sutherlands who are both kids for the most part, but who want to get in the record books and want to do something famous. Um, there's also a bunch of kids that race that were both kids that are racers today. Um, that's all, you know, they like racing. They're in a certain class and they go racing. Um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So I think the world of children on boats is a fascinating world. I see nothing but upside for them. And I, I'm always impressed and I'm always very happy because I think boat kids are like the coolest. Thanks for sharing, Scott. That was a great story. What do we have in store for next week's episode? I'm going to talk about gas and power. That'll be the title of it. I'm going to get into a little bit of the weeds with some of the liveaboard techniques in terms of uh, propane, electricity, some of the things you should probably have, some some little tricks to get around. Um, and um, yeah, just I'm just going to get into the whole uh, realm of uh, gas and power. And I'm, I'm probably going to touch a little bit on electric boats as well. Thank you for tuning in. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, be sure to rate and review. You can find us on Facebook and at offshoreexplorer.org. You can also listen to past episodes at offshore-explorer.simplecast.com. Our theme song is sung by Paulette McWilliams, with additional music by Amanu Itomi and Tommy Twain. Until next time, fair winds and calm seas. <laughs> <laughs>